Good morning. Hey, welcome to Newark NAS. You probably feel uh, an air of excitement uh, when you came in today, and that's because today we are voting on a new pastor, Pastor Don Ballard. So that's exciting. If you are an active member of the church, age 15 or older, we invite you to vote in the next step room in the upper lobby after the service today. Well, a couple times a year, I invite anyone who wants to sing in the choir uh, for one Sunday to come and join us. This is your invitation. Come join us for All God's People on Sunday, September 27th. All you have to do is show up for practice on uh, Wednesday, September 23rd at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Melissa's going to come. Melissa, will you come here for a minute? Or just, yeah, use this mic if you want to. Just tell us what's coming up. Next Saturday, for all you ladies, and I see a lot of ladies in here. Who doesn't like girl time, right? We have a whole day planned for you, and um, there are tickets for sale in the lobby. And I just want to tell you, if you haven't been to one of these events, they are absolutely life-changing. Who's been to a woven retreat day or weekend? Life-changing. There's nothing like being with your sisters and just being able to worship and experience God. So I really encourage you to hit that Welcome Center out there and get your tickets this morning. Uh, there is a limited amount of room, so uh, we hope to see you there. Uh, also, there's so many things happening in the life of our church this month that we're not able to mention them all. I'll just uh, give an honorable mention here. Like, there's a dinner for a new class for married couples, and uh, there's just things like that, one after the other. And so I just want you to take time to read your worship folder for all the events and classes and serving opportunities that are coming up. Uh, last thing, if you're visiting today, we welcome you. Thank you for joining us. We are so glad you're here. Please take a moment, if you would, and fill out your connection card. You'll find that inside your worship folder, or you can use your phone and log on to newarknazguest.org. Stop by the, uh, the Welcome Center in the lobby after the service. Uh, we have a special gift for you. We'd love to connect and meet with you. Well, as we prepare our hearts to worship God this morning, let's remember his words from Psalm 23. Let's stand together. Father, we are here for you. We love you. We worship you with all of our hearts this morning. Amen.
Constant in the trial and the change. 
than God's love. I know this because his love has set me free. I am free from my past. I am free from my sin. And I am free from shame and embarrassment. His love provides clarity and it's the source of my security. The power of Christ's love on the cross is everything. As we reflect on our own journey with Christ, let's listen to this story of God's transforming love. Hi, my name is Melissa Benson, and this is my story. I grew up in a Christian family. I'm the youngest of four, and I went to Christian school and went to church twice a week. Um, my parents, it was a solid foundation that my parents gave me. My parents got divorced when I was 12, and around that age is when I started abusing drugs and alcohol, and uh, it escalated, and so for the next 25 years or so, um, that was the course that my life took. I um, found myself deep in an addiction that I couldn't control. Um, I had a hole in my, my heart that I wanted to feel, it felt like all the time. I hated myself. Um, my relationship with my children's father had crumbled. Um, I lost custody of my children. Um, I was homeless. I met a friend in AA one day on Father's Day of 2012. I was about 60 days sober. And uh, she invited me to come to New Life. And I came in that day and I was sold. I mean, this place, I love this place. Um, I've been coming here ever since. I've joined two growth groups, the Singles Plus and the Al-Anon group. I've been going to them for a little while. And um, I remember one of the messages uh, that really touched my heart from Pastor Isaiah um, about when the with Moses and um, how the Israelites are about to cross the Red Sea and when, uh, how he said that God had told him to raise his staff and said, I will make the way. And I just felt, it's like God told me, I will make the way for you. And so many doors have opened up since then made the way so much. I have custody of my kids back. I have an apartment. I have everything that I need. You know, I'm blessed. I, my life is so good now. I, I'm so grateful. And I'm so excited for this next step. So today I want to publicly declare that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior.
but the birds have left me weary and dry. I'm trying to trusting this weight is released, this cross I am bearing.
Pray with me today, if you would. Father God, I thank you today for the grace that you extend to each of us. Grace undeserved and grace that um, unfortunately at times goes unrecognized. We are grateful today, Father, for the grace that has been extended to us and the life that that grace brings. We pray today that you would help us to be men and women who live out that grace in front of the world around us. As well today, Father, we recognize the significance of this day and that um, we are, as a congregation, uh, voting on a new leader for this church. We pray today for wisdom, for clarity of mind. We ask today, Father, that you would go before us, that you would give us a deep sense of your desire and your presence in the midst of this. I ask today, Father, that you would prepare a family as they um, prepare to possibly move this way. I ask today, Father, that uh, your hand would be upon this congregation, upon this church. I am thankful today, Father, for the impact that they make in their community, for the way that you use them, for the difference that they have made in my life and in the lives of others. I pray today that you would go before them. For some of those who sit in this room today, Father, that have significant issues that they are facing, I pray today for peace, first of all, that there would be a deep peace in their lives, a deep confidence and certainty that your presence is with them, that you would go before them, go with them, and surround them. I ask today, Father, that you would use their hands and their feet to be a, um, a source of peace to the world around them. And may our lives and this service and the word spoken today bring honor to you. Amen. Hey, today we continue our conversation about the book of Exodus. Now, as we do that today and as we begin to look at it, we are going to look at a very large portion of the book of Exodus today. We will not read it all. Uh, please know that. It would take us a long time to read all of this. What we will do today is simply I will kind of talk to you about these elements of this portion of Exodus, and then I want to encourage you to actually take some time over the course of this week to read these chapters. They are beautiful chapters in the story. Today we look at chapters 15 16 and 17. Three chapters, three moments of significant need, and three instances where God intervenes. The people of Israel have crossed through the Red Sea, as we talked about last week. God has parted the Red Sea, the chaos in front of them, the chaos of the waters that stir in front of them as Pharaoh's army bears down upon them. And they walk through the chaos on dry ground. As they come to the other side, needless to say, there is reason to rejoice and celebrate. God is good, and God has been good to them. And he has led them out of, the, out of their slavery and through the chaos. And in doing so, they have uh, in turn come to a place where at the edge of the Red Sea on the other side, they camp and they begin to just celebrate. They sing this beautiful song celebrating what God has done through Moses and Miriam, his wife, and just rejoicing in all of it. It is a beautiful thing. The problem is this. As the music dies down and the song stops, they uh, head into the desert into the desert of Shur. As they head into the desert of Shur, uh, they very quickly realize that they have managed to pillage much of Egypt. They have gone out of their, they have walked out of their slavery. They have walked out of all that is going on, but their very basic needs they cannot meet. Their very basic needs are not being met. The things that they desperately have to have. 
So in chapter 15, at the very end of chapter 15, which we will read today, you will see that they find that they have journeyed into the desert of Shur for three days, only to discover that they have no water. And it's not good. God gives them the water that they look for, that they long for, that they need. They continue their journey only to discover that not only now do they not can they struggle finding water, but now they don't have food, and this is not good. And they once again begin to cry out. They begin to complain. They get grumpy. I don't know if you recognize those Snicker commercials where they have the individual who uh, you know needs a little something to eat. That's me. That's my youngest son who, when we're not doing well, our wife says, we got to get you guys something to eat. This isn't going good for us. That is the people of Israel throughout chapter 16. And then in chapter 17, as chapter 17 begins to unfold and all of it begins to happen and take place, once again, they are without water. These uh, issues of food crisis that they have, food and water crisis that they continue to have, quickly elevate to the point where they are spiritual crisis in their own lives. The people have wandered into the desert, and in the desert, they discover that their needs are even more real than they were before. Egypt meant slavery and bondage, but Egypt had water. Egypt meant beatings and work without pay. Egypt was a terrible place to live, but at least they fed us. Now we're in the desert. We have our freedom. But the desert does not mean, or our freedom does not guarantee that there will not still be issues in our lives. Our freedom out of our slavery, our freedom out of our bondage, our ability to make our way through the chaos of life does not mean that there are no longer issues and concerns and needs, real needs for the people of God. Those things are still very real. So, with that said, let's look today at uh, Exodus chapter 15. This is verses 22 through uh, 26. Now, again, we have to cover a whole lot of territory this morning. And so I'll move very, very quickly. You'll see a lot of stuff on the screen. You'll see more stuff on the screen than you will me on the screen. And that's always good for me and probably y'all. And so y'all see it up here this morning. It'll be a good thing. This is what it says. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled into the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Mara. So the, that was really brilliant, wasn't it, on the writer's part? So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. Now, we'll talk about that in a few moments. For I am the Lord who heals you. I am the Lord who heals you. This is one of the more interesting moments in Scripture. Part of what I love about verse chapters 15, 16, and 17 is that these instances are things that you and I can relate to. We have very real needs in our lives. And yet, if we're really honest and truthful about it, we often find ourselves living in the same place as the people of Israel. We are a people just by nature. I think it's all of us that sometimes it's just easy to grumble. 
It's just easy to complain. In fact, if we're truthful about it, periodically it's kind of fun. And just to say, here's all the things I don't like. Let me make the list. There are moments in that when sometimes as that begins to happen, you and I begin to discover that grumbling can be a very interesting thing. You see, grumbling really is one of those things that places the focus on me. If we were to read all of chapter 15, 16, and 17, you would see these moments where the people of Israel begin to grumble. And in each case they do, grumble and complain. And as they do, every time they state it, the focus is on them. In, verse 50, or in chapter 15, what are we to drink, they ask. In chapter 16, you have brought us out into this desert to starve the entire assembly. I love it. It sounds just like, this is awful, please forgive me, a junior high girl. Everyone hates me. I don't have any friends. All of life is miserable for me. Or chapter 17. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt? To make us die of thirst. It is that sense where they realize or where they, as they state all of this, that the focus of all of it is solely on them. They have lost sight of what God has done. They have lost sight of what God is capable of doing and where God is leading them and instead, instead turn their focus solely on themselves. The issue in this is that it not only puts the focus on them, but that it often means that the focus of their faith is shallow. Their inability to see what God is capable of doing beyond what they want. When I was a pastor, I remember very distinctly there was a, some folks in the church who, were, who had been a part of the church for a long, long time, a husband and a wife. And um, they were not particularly fond of me as their pastor. That didn't really concern me because they didn't like the guy before me either. And it didn't concern me, concerned me even less because they didn't like the guy before him either. And so it had been literally decades since they had found a pastor that they actually liked. And it wasn't just that they didn't like me. They didn't like anything about the direction of the church. They were hacked. And they were in leadership, a significant role of leadership within the framework of the church. And I remember one day sitting across from the man, and we were talking about all of it. And um, as we began to discuss it, you know, I named out all the things in the church that he hated. And I, and I was talking about them just very openly. You don't like this. You don't like this. You don't like that. There's all these things you don't like. And, um, and I said, you know, we would really be great friends if we lived next door to each other. The problem is I'm your pastor. And so you're not happy. And he said, you know, Scott, here's the problem. He said, I've given the last 30 plus years of my life to this church. And this is what you're giving me back. Now, in that moment, I, I didn't quite know what to speak. I know what I wanted to say. But I thought to myself in that moment, you know, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Because um, I had some things, I, I mean, I just, oh, I just, I just said, I'm not saying a word. But for him, it was really one of these things where the focus was really on him, what he liked, what he wanted. And because he was in leadership within the framework of the church, his grumbling and complaining was often contagious. In fact, when you look at this story of faith, in the people of Israel, you find that their grumbling is constantly a contagious thing. In fact, in this first passage that we read in verse 15, it states that um, the people, some people came to talk to Moses about the fact that they were thirsty. But by the time we get to chapter 16, it tells us that in the desert, the whole community, all of them show up. The whole group shows up to say, hey, we're hungry. We need a little something here. And in this, what you begin to discover is that this sense of grumbling can be a very contagious thing in our lives. And in 
reality for the people of Israel, while it started in chapter 15 really strong, it follows them all the way through the desert. In fact, it is passed on from generation to generation that they grumble, that they complain, and it becomes this contagious thing that takes over this community. I was reminded of this whole idea of grumbling being contagious if years ago when uh, we lived in another community, a small community in Kansas, and I was on staff at a church. We had a, Katie and I were living in a house, we had a yard, and I had purchased a um, lawnmower at a garage sale. Bad idea. I purchased the, gar- the lawnmower at the garage sale, and I thought, you know, I'm not buying a new lawnmower. I'll buy this one for 30 bucks. I'll keep it running for a couple years. I can work on this. Life will be good. And so the problem was it only worked about half the time. I remember one day going out to mow the yard. I had mowed the front yard, and all had gone well. I had turned off the lawnmower to go inside the house to get something to drink. And when I came out, the youngest child, who at the time was maybe three and a half, four at best, came out following me. And as he came out, he grabbed his little plastic lawnmower and pushed it over behind me, which I did not realize. And as I tried to get that lawnmower to start, it would not start. And right there in front of the neighborhood, I cashed it all in. I cashed my Christianity in. I lost it. I mean, I just thought, I'll straighten this up tomorrow at church, but I am losing it right here. And I did. I cashed it in only to turn around and see the four-year-old, three-and-a-half-year-old doing the exact same thing to his plastic lawnmower. In that, I thought, this is bad. This is real bad. You see, that grumbling is contagious. When we begin to do it, it is passed on from generation to generation. And beyond that, in this passage, we discover that Our grumbling has larger consequences, bigger consequences. In fact, which we'll see here in a few moments, this grumbling is not just simply directed toward Moses, but it is directed towards God. Now, when we grumble, it brings into question several things in our lives. Grumbling brings into question the whole idea of leadership. And we begin to grumble against leadership. And so verses chapter 15 tells us, so the people grumbled against Moses. And this can be a very dangerous thing for us as a community of faith. Yet it is something that we often, as I said before, actually sometimes even enjoy. And even at times see as our inalienable right to somehow just complain about leadership. Now, you think, Scott, that's not true. But you think about your favorite football team, whichever one, you pick it. Whenever life goes bad for them, the very first thing we want to say is often we got to fire that coach. That guy's a nut. He doesn't have slightest clue what he's doing. He's an idiot. Or whoever is leading a certain political portion of our country, we will often grumble about. Or sometimes we even grumble about things at work. Places and situations where we say, I don't like my boss. My boss doesn't have the slightest clue. You name it. It is one of these things where we begin to believe that grumbling is okay when it comes to leadership. And it is not. There is a problem with it. But beyond that, grumbling brings into question God's care. Chapter 16. You are not grumbling against us, Moses says, but against the Lord. When we begin to grumble, we grumble about even the very idea that God cares enough to intervene, that God cares enough to actually act on our behalf, that God cares enough to even recognize or know where we are at. And in that, when we begin to do that, our grumbling brings into question the very fact that God's presence is real in our lives. That he is really capable of doing what he says he will do. 
One of the beautiful things, one of the most interesting things about chapter 17 and when the second time they're grumbling about water is it comes to this point where the people actually kind of imply and say to God, prove it. Prove to us that you're capable of doing what you say you can do. So in chapter 17, verse 2, it says, give give us water to drink. That's what the people of Israel say to Moses. And this is even after he said to them, you're not complaining to me, you're complaining to God. I want to keep you, you remind you of that. They're saying to him, this is no longer a request. This is a demand. This is no longer a, uh, a communication of the need that I have. You know, God, I really need this. That's not it. They are now demanding that God act, that he moves, that he proves that he is capable of doing what he has done before. And in this statement, they make, a, they make it almost as if their faith is contingent upon God's willingness to act and actually demonstrate his presence in their lives. In fact, I love the way that chapter 17, or that this section of chapter 17 ends. It says this, the Israelites quarreled And because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? In other words, again, they are literally saying, prove it. Prove to us, God, that you are actually capable of doing this. And what happens in this is when we live in that kind of place, we move to a situation and to places in life where the discernment of God's presence in our ordinary day in and day out lives leads us to the point. Let me say that again. I I missaid what I wanted to say there, so let me say it again. It is a lack of discernment of God's presence in our ordinary everyday lives that often leads us to the denial of God's activity in the extraordinary ways in our lives. When we begin to overlook the fact that God is doing something simple, basic, ordinary in our lives, then we often miss the extraordinary things He wants to do and is capable of doing. The people of Israel began to say, we don't care about what he's done before. I don't care about what he did yesterday. I don't care about what he did this morning. Do it now. That's a dangerous place for us to live as Christians. And the issue of grumbling has several effects in our lives. The issue of grumbling affects our ability to demonstrate trust in God in our lives. It brings faith and trust into question. And it causes each of us and caused the people of God to challenge God's ability to act, to move. They began to ask themselves in a sense, can we trust the God who gives us freedom? Can we trust the God who provides a way through the chaos? Can we trust the God who defeated Pharaoh? And in the case of these situations and passages, Obedience is a way of exhibiting that trust. That's what God is saying when he says, if you choose to live appropriately, I won't, these things won't happen to you. Obey. That's what he's ultimately saying in this. Now, this entire passage, you really begin to see it if we were to go back today and study chapter 16. You begin to see this idea of how trust plays out in this grumbling and what it demonstrates in chapter 16 it's the story of the manna the people have in chapter 15 are without water in chapter 15 they, 16 they are without food and Moses says here's what'll do what we'll do God's going to cause the dew on the ground to fall or the falling ground the, you know what I mean on the ground <laughs> and in the morning when you rise The dew will become manna. That manna is bread. It's there for you to eat. But as you get it, you only get what you need for that day. That's it. And then the day before the Sabbath, you can take two days. But don't take any more. 
And so immediately, as it all begins to unfold, some of the people do what they're instructed to do, and some of the people actually go out and collect much, much more. They hoard it. They gather it all in, only to discover that the next day it has gone bad. It is sour. It is rotten. It is full of worms. And it's, they're unable to eat it. And it's an issue of trust. Do you trust God enough, Moses is saying, to believe that he will provide for you what you need day in and day out. That he knows your needs. He hears your cry. He knows what you actually need in your life. Will you trust him? But it also, this sense of grumbling also affects the health of those who grumble. You see that at the end of verse 15. I am the Lord who heals you. Now remember, he proceeds this with, trust me enough to do what I ask you to do, to live as I instruct you to live. And remember that I am the God who heals you. This deep sense of grumbling that the people of Israel demonstrate can be a destructive force and bring disease and defeat to our spiritual lives and to our own communities. And in, in this instance, it is a question of their faith and their obedience. Again, what is going on here? Do you trust me enough to believe that I'll do what I said I would do is what God is saying. God is first and foremost in this passage a God who heals. And so what he's asking them to do is remember, I care for you. I've brought you this far. And if I've brought you this far, I will carry you the rest of the way. Do you trust me? But you'll also see that the issue of grumbling affects the sight of the people. In fact, I wish we had time today to read chapter 16. In chapter 16, verse 10, the people are crying out and grumbling about their hunger. They are sick and tired of this, and they need something to eat. And Aaron begins to instruct them. And it says this, While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked up towards the desert. In the desert! They looked towards the desert, and there, in the desert, was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. These people were so consumed with their own hurt, their own pain, their grumbling, their own desires, their own wants, that they had forgotten to actually look up at what God could do. To look up and see the presence of the Lord working in and around and with them. That's important for you and me. It's important for you and me because when we reach the place where what we want to do is grumble and complain, remember what the focus becomes is us. It's no longer out there up in, in the clouds of what God is capable of doing, what he has done before, resting assured and confident and trusting that he will do it again. So, part of what is happening in this is their encouragement to look and see what God is doing. Our ability to overcome our grumbling. Is tied to several things in this story. Our own ability to overcome it is tied to our ability to recognize our need. Overcoming grumbling starts with recognizing our own needs. Now let's be honest about this. Food and water are real needs. So, the people of Israel had reason to say, hey, we're thirsty. And I think they had real reason to say, hey, we're hungry. I just got to tell you, God, I'm hungry. And God, I'm thirsty. Those are real, legitimate needs. But too often where we live is not in our ability to cry out for our needs. We grumble about our complaints, our frustrations, our irritations, our wants, our desires. But they aren't 
real needs. Katie and I have a friend that we love dearly. She's in her late 20s. We have known her since she was in kindergarten. And she is just adorable. And she will often say to us when we are with her, we'll begin to talk about things, and she makes this hysterical statement that I just love. We were with her several years ago, and she was talking about her car. And that the fact that the uh, cigarette lighter in her car did not work, and so she could not plug in the charger for her phone. And as she's talking about it or getting ready to talk about it, she made this statement, the one I love, the one that she makes about a lot of things. And she'll say, I know it's a first world need, but (laughs) I love the statement because in that instance, what she declares is, yeah, 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 yeah. This is not food or water. I know it, but man, I really wish this stupid cigarette lighter worked. I mean, it's awesome. This is a... First world need. And that's the place where most of us, let's just be honest about it. When we start to talk about what we think are our needs in life, for the vast majority of us, and I mean the vast majority of us, they are first world needs. Not issues of food and water. You see, the God we serve is really okay with us crying out about our needs. We need to recognize our needs. We need to know what they are. But God gives us permission to speak those needs. You remember? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. That's my need. That's my need. And the God we serve, we trust to provide our need. What we have to remember is what's the real need. But overcoming our grumbling also trust that God knows our need. That he recognizes and sees it. That he is aware of it. That despite the fact that I speak it, that I pray it, that I cry it out, that I really do believe that he knows it. But the last thing is the deep belief that overcoming our grumbling means looking toward the desert. Looking up. Lifting our eyes off of ourselves and realizing that the presence of the Lord is still very real in the desert. You see, here's my deepest concern for us, especially as evangelical North American Christians. We believe that God always has to be on the mountaintop. That somehow God is only working in our lives when everything is great. When we're living on the mountaintop of faith and our life is great and grand and good, God is there. But when we live in the desert, somehow we as North American evangelical Christians, we begin to believe, you know, God's not even in the desert. God's not there. And yet, friend, listen to me. The people of Israel saw the presence of God in the midst of the desert. When life seems dry, when it seems as if you have been forgotten, when it feels like all is lost and you are just wandering no place, hear me, friend. God is there. Perhaps what we need is an understanding that God's hand is at work and sometimes can be much easier to see in the desert when life is difficult, when water and food are in need. Maybe that's 
what the writer of the psalm meant. When the psalmist wrote in chapter 34, verse 8, taste and see that the Lord, he is good. You see, friend, could it be that God is working in our lives even when we don't see it or realize it? Could it be that our lives lived in the desert can actually provide opportunity for us and others to see what God is capable of doing? I challenge you today to look up, to look up and see the presence of the Lord working in the places where you need him, even in the desert. Now, today, what did I do with it? There it is right there. As you came in today in your worship folder, you got one of these. It's a purple little card with a black arrow pointing up in front of it, at the top of it. Maybe you're like me. I journal. That's what I do. Some of you don't. I know. But maybe instead of always listing out my needs, Maybe what I could begin to do is list out a reminder of the ways that God is working in the desert. I want to encourage you this week. Don't be afraid to write down your needs. But friend, I want to encourage you this week to take the time to write down some place every single day where God is doing something in your life, in the life of someone you love, to look up and see and taste that the Lord God is good. Let's sing together. As we sing right now, the usher is going to come and we're going to continue to worship him by giving our tithes and offerings. That's right.
stand with me if you would today. Before I pronounce the blessing, let me remind you that we are voting on a pastor today. For those of you who are members of the church 15 years or older and in good standing, as you leave today, you'll go out the lobby and up the steps. There's a room on the right. We want you to vote. It'll be a good day. May God the Father bless you and keep you. Oh, I pray today, friend, I pray today that he would provide all your needs, that the God we serve would hear your cries, and that he would turn your cries into songs of thanksgiving as you live your life praising and celebrating the God who meets all your needs. God bless you. Go in peace. I'll see you next Sunday.